Uh, Ken has uh, always been a great friend uh, of, of, of uh, this federation, and, but a personal friend of mine for a good number of years. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Brother Ken Giorgetti and ask him to come forward to speak. They had to explain to me about the escorts because I thought they were watching the silverware when it happened for me. <laughs> Jeez, Ricky, uh, that introduction is longer than my speech, I think. So thank you. Uh, listen, thank you so much, and, and thank you to all of the, uh, the executive and the delegates for, for making this accommodation. I do have to be back in Ottawa for a very important meeting tomorrow on the, uh, on the G20 summit that's going to take place. Uh, the week after next in, uh, in France on the plight of ordinary working people that suffer a lot more uh, than we have, actually. But I'm pleased to start by bringing you greetings from Hassan and Barb Byers and Sister Marie Clark Walker on behalf of our Executive Council and now the 3.2 million workers who are proud to call themselves members of this Canadian Labour Congress. Rick, uh, thank you so much always for inviting me today. And Rick sure does a great job in representing the interests of the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour at the CLC's Executive Council and always making sure that uh, your province's issues are front of mind and on our agenda. Unfortunately, yeah, you bet. Unfortunately, Rick gets a bit enthusiastic from time to time about uh, Nova Scotia. I did have to turn him down on his request that we move our entire CLC office from Ottawa to Halifax. But who needs jobs, CLC jobs, moving from, to Nova Scotia when you just got the biggest shipbuilding contract in Canadian history, huh? Wow. You know, congratulations to the uh, Nova Scotia Fed, to the unions representing shipyard workers, the trades workers, and to Nova Scotia Premier Daryl Dexter for ensuring that shipbuilding industry, an industry that belongs here, is going to stay here in Canada and will once again prosper and, and get ahead. That's just an amazing, amazing accomplishment. $25 billion here on this coast, 20 or $8 billion back in my home province of BC. All of those contracts I point out already and will, will crow from the podium as much as I can are all union jobs. They won them because they had the quality and the stats of traits. I'll tell you, there's tears of joy here and in BC, but at the Alberta Tar Sands, I'm telling you, they're crying tears. People are moving home already from the, from the, to Nova Scotia. They're moving back to Ibernia and Churchill. And in Alberta, they're going to be uh, suffering like crazy trying to find qualified trades. But it also means building infrastructure and training new workers will allow Canada to compete fairly with other shipbuilding countries and win new contracts for even more work for decades and generations to come, I hope. That's good news for Nova Scotia workers, but also good news for all workers in Canada. It's an enormous economic boost for Nova Scotia and one of your key unionized industry. It also means something else, uh, something unrelated to shipbuilding. It means that the, the business fear-mongering about unions and scaring away jobs and investment is nothing but stale hot air now, isn't it? They came here, they saw the quality, and they awarded the contracts. Only those contracts were evaluated on the basis of numbers in Ottawa. And they looked at the skill of the workforce, the ability of, of the shipyards to, to do the work, and they gave it on its merits. And the merits said, unionized, qualified workers means where the contracts go. That's, a, that's amazing. Just ask those shipyard workers at Irving, huh? So I also believe it's now's the time for another significant announcement. I think it's time for the NDP government here to make its own announcement, that it's time for Nova Scotia to have first contract legislation around these jobs. Huh? It's about fundamental fundamental democratic rights about the ability for every worker in Nova Scotia to exercise their rights to join a union and represent them in the workplace because those jobs in the ship in the shipbuilding will bring other jobs and the spin-off effect those are good jobs highly paid 
and there would be a lot of other jobs around it. And saying to those workers, they have a right too to join a union. And then allowing that employer to do everything possible to frustrate that for months and years by abusing the process is wrong. Employers shouldn't get a vote in who joins a union, in my view. They don't have a right to have a vote. The workers have that right. The legislation exists in other provinces. And while not perfect, it's allowed workers to form unions successfully without intimidation and coercion from their employers. And it's often removed that irrational exemption some employers have to unions from poisoning the workplace or leading to lengthy lockouts or strikes for a first collective agreement. That's wrong. But I also want to say that the fight for first contract legislation is more than just workers' rights. It's about the single most important public policy measure to address us today, and that is wage inequity, to reduce the gap between the rich and the poor. You've seen it all over now, and that is the ability to join a union, to negotiate for your wages and your benefits and your pension, has done more to build the middle class in this country and around the world, I would safely say, than any other government measure, any other monetary measure or taxation measure can possibly achieve that that single right, our right to have some say in our workplace and share in the success and the wealth of that workplace has done more to build the middle class than anything any government can do. You think about that. That's where we were. Women do better when they're in a union and have a union contract. We know that. Workers of color do better when they have a union and they have a union contract. We know that. Workers with disabilities do better when they're in a union and have a union contract. And young workers do way better when they have a union and a union contract. So I commend the Nova Scotia Fed, Rick, for your strong campaign to bring that first contract legislation and I've urged, and I will continue to urge, Premier Dexter and his government to listen to working people in this province. Block out that hysterical element of the business community who oppose basic worker rights and stand in the way of worker earning decent wages. Block those out, Premier Dexter. That's greed you're listening to there. So I want to just talk a bit about the, what to say the CLC is concerned also about the closure of the new page paper mill in in Port Hawkesbury and the terrible impact that's going to have on, on more than 500 workers and their families and feed that entire community. That's a shock and that's devastating. We stand, I want to say, publicly on the record with the members of CEP Local 972. We encourage their efforts to find a new buyer and to maintain the jobs there. And it's important again to thank your federation and all of you for supporting that campaign. But you know, thank you. But situations like that new page paper mill are far from unique. Unfortunately, we see them all the time across Canada and the United States and other countries where workers are fa fa facing a lot of job losses, largely due to a lot of corporate greed, and more importantly, the incompetence, I might say. That relentless pursuit of those windfall profits is paid for by an enormous cost to working people. That's one of the biggest reasons why that Occupy Wall Street movement has spread to cities beyond New York and into Canada. I was in Toronto actually yesterday, day before yesterday, and saw them and worked with them and marched with them a little bit on the street. They've got a camp going there. They've got a small one in Ottawa. I hear the Mayor Edmonton wants to get rid of that one there. He didn't like what they were saying. But I want to tell you that our labour movement welcomes what these young people are doing. They're camping outdoors and they're staying in tents and saying, because we've said for this very same issues for a very long time that it's time to get some greed out of the system that the one percent that one percent who are the mega rich they make windfall profits while 95 percent or 99 percent of us who are ordinary working people pay the price that the growing income equality and inequality is hurting our society that corporate greed has caused yet another market meltdown the fifth one in 25 years they're saying that we're angry. Angry with governments that drive the getaway car for these big business bandits instead of stopping that ripoff what they're supposed to do. And that despite what the TV ad, you heard that big bank claim that, which I don't know what bank it is, that you're richer than you think? You heard that ad? Yeah, Scotia Bank, you're richer. Well, we're poorer than we should be. 
because banks and corporations don't share that wealth. They've got all the deregulation, all the things they've asked for, and guess what? We're getting poorer. So while we may not always disagree or agree with the tactics or, or the strategy that some of those uh, occupiers of Wall Street do, we can sure completely agree with the principles behind that protest, I think. We've been doing it for a long time. But you know what? Strange times, you guys. We've been living in some interesting times. We've got new allies. They're angry about income equality. See if you can guess who said this publicly on, on Twitter, and I quote, class warfare by the 99%. Of course they're fighting back after 30 years of being shot at. Was that an American union leader? No. A left-wing professor? No. It's a guy named Bill Gross. Bill runs the world's largest bond fund. It's worth $1.2 trillion. That's $12,000 million. It's called the Pacific Investment Management Company. Can you believe what he said? Then there's Warren Buffett, the third wealthiest man in the entire world, worth $50 billion, this guy, by himself. $50 billion. And what's Buffett telling the American government and Obama? Stop coddling the super rich, he said. Holy cow. That's a direct quote. Billionaire Buffett actually wants higher taxes imposed on the wealthy. I think probably because he hears this coming. And he thinks he can mitigate some of this stuff if he gets ahead of it. But here's the key thing Buffett said. We mega rich continue to get our extraordinary tax breaks. Buffett should know. He earns $40 million a year just from spinning his money around, putting it in the market and pulling it back. This guy earns $40 billion a year, and he gets taxed 17% on that money, on his income tax. It's outrageous. Not one person in this room pays that low an income tax rate. Yet Buffett isn't the exception. But here's the rule. Because he makes money from money, not from an honest day's work like our members. Because if you work hard and make an honest day's work, you get taxed at almost double what Buffett pays. But if you make money because you have money, you get a break. And don't foolishly think that doesn't happen in Canada. Listen to this one, the head of one of Canada's largest TV and cable companies, Shaw Communication. CEO Jim Shaw, I know him, 53 years old. Jimmy got a little, uh, a little in trouble at uh, an investor's dinner he had one night. I don't know what his condition was, but he said some things he shouldn't have and pissed off a lot of investors. So Shaw decided that Jimmy should go on pension. And they were going to give him a pension that pays him $16,000. Now that's not $16,000 a year for good old Jimmy's hard work at ripe old age of 53. That would be a lot more than the average Canada Pension Plan benefit of $6,000 a year. But no, no, Jimmy's not, not even going to get $16,000 a month. That would be $192,000 a year, four times more than the average Canadian worker makes. No, Jimmy, for his little malfeasance and bad day on the, uh, at the retirement party, he's going to get $16,000 a day, every single day. That's what Jimmy gets for messing up that dinner meeting with his investors. That's six million, six million dollars a year for the rest of his life. He makes the maximum yearly Canada pension plan benefit every 17 hours, my friends. <laughs> and yet Shaw and his super rich CEO friends tell us at the CLC and Ricky when we're at parliamentary hearings and forget about that plan to dramatically improve Canada pension so all Canadians can retire in security and dignity. You're asking too much, they say to us. What do you expect? We can't afford to make those Canada pension plan payments, they say. My friends, the reality is simple. The American billionaires are telling the truth when they admit that a class war was quietly declared on us 30 years ago. Now, I don't mind a good fight, but I want to tell you from, from this podium, we're losing that fight. It's time to change. It's a class war raged, waged by the super rich and big businesses against ordinary working people who you and I represent. It's that simple. This uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, economist Paul Krugman 
He explained in the New York Times column, I couldn't say it better. He said, the way to understand all of this is to realize that it's part of a broader syndrome in which wealthy Americans who benefit hugely from a system rigged in their favor react hysterically to anyone who points out just how rigged the system is. See, they don't like it because they don't want it changed. They've got what they want. They've got free trade agreements. They've got deregulation. They've got low taxes. Why would they want anything to change? Why do they want those young people on Wall Street or in downtown Toronto on Bay Street to succeed? They don't. And that's why guys like Bill Gross and Warren Buffett want to get ahead of this thing because they don't want it to get too far in front of them. I call it kind of like the stop clock theory. You know, stop clock is right twice a day. So were these guys, once. But at least a few of the wealthy are telling the truth. At least they have the courage to say something. And the truth is, we're being played with a bait and switch game. Unions have been framed by our, point, our, our opponents and, and painted the way the bad guys want us to be painted. We have to change that. Then they try to frame us and we have to try to fight that fiction with some facts. And I think some of the best friends we've got are those little handheld devices everybody has, either on the table or in their pockets. I think it's going to cause a new serious injury. Everyone with their head down, we're going to get a bad cervical spine from going like this and our thumbs are going to get all frozen. But it's a good friend we have, that tool, because we can go on things like Twitter and Facebook and blogs and texting and the internet like Tony Tracy does for us all the time. <laughs> He's doing it right now. I saw him do a pan and he's on the internet telling people what we're talking about. And you can't filter it. You can't, if you're Rupert Murdoch or you own the Globe and Mail or you own five, five tweets already, I think I got, yeah. But they can't filter that information anymore. And that's why you see what's happening in the Middle East. People are talking to each other and saying, gee, all the things we've been told aren't true. Democracy actually works, you know? In Saudi Arabia, they look at their, 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 their Twitters and say, women can drive cars in North America? They were told that wasn't true. They can't be lied to anymore. We have a great tool there. And I said at the CLC convention in May, we can't be playing eight-track tapes and expect to organize workers listening to iPods on their iPhones or podcasts on their iPhones. We have to change. We have to be more relevant to our members and, of course, to the public. But we have to do more talking through that unfiltered media where, where our direct, direct message can be heard for a change. Because we have a compelling story to tell, that union advantage that we and particularly the people that came before us created. I couldn't wait to get a union job. My wife sits on the apprenticeship board, a right wing, a right -wing guy from the, from the waterfront sits on the board with her. I know him from my experience in BC, mean guy. He was saying to her, you know, I got two sons. One's a journey electrician, one's an apprentice. The journey electrician's a union, he's got a union job. And he says, you know, my son is apprenticing a non-union shop. He can't wait to get his papers because he wants to quit and go get a union job because he can see the benefits of that. So can their father, but he'll go back to BC and kick the hell out of us in the waterfront because that's the job he's been trained to do. But for his sons, he wants them to have a union job because he can add. It's not rocket science, it's arithmetic. And it works so well. And the key ways we're going to get out of this mess is we've got to win this class war being waged against us. And that's what I want to talk to you about just to finish my speech, if you will. Unfortunately, we have some impressive political action successes. There's more to report, though, from Ottawa, the home of Stephen Harper. Be very afraid of this majority government. They're not going to help us at all. You saw what they did at the post office. Not only did they order those postal workers back to work from a lockout imposed by a corporation owned by this government, but they reduced the wage settlement with the legislation. They said, oh, no, we don't even like what our own people put on the table. We're going to make it lower just to, just to rub, rub it into you. And then comes Air Canada, a private employer in this country with flight attendants who have one of the hardest jobs, I think, going. 
they get the crap for everybody's planes late or delayed or, or whatever. They have to sit to have their lunch at, right next to the door to the washroom. They stand on their feet all day. They work very hard. And this government says, you can't exercise your rights to bargain anymore. We're going to take those away. Just like that. Snap. Twice. Took them away. This is very scary government. And they're desperate, this government, to make sure that they tell us a lesson. Remember, Stephen Harper came from a group called the National Citizens Coalition. That's the group that challenged us at the Supreme Court on the RAND formula. But they can't take that away from us. We're not going to let them, are we? But I want to remind you, just 20 years ago now, I had a lot more hair back then. But when I was growing up, you know, you could actually work full time at a supermarket and support a family. My best friend, six, uh, six members of the family when I grew up, six members of the family, mom chose to stay at home, father worked at a Safeway store, supported that family, three of them went to university, and at the end of his career working at Safeway, he retired with a pension that gave him a dignified retirement. Today it barely pays minimum wage. You'd have a reasonable wage and benefits and dental care and vision plans, you know those things, they, they came from bargaining. I just remember in our town when we first, my dad was on the bargaining committee, got a dental plan. I never seen so many dentists move to town. <laughs> Boy, it was good money. Opticians, all of that. But it wasn't just supermarkets, there were lots of other examples. Jobs in construction, auto manufacturing plants, department stores, gas stations. All those family supporting jobs were there because workers had a union advantage. Both directly and indirectly. I remember when I was president of my local, I was shocked, not shocked, but surprised at all the people that came in when we were on strike that worked all over town and, and auto mechanics and others came in and gave donations to our strike fund because they knew the day after our contract was settled, they too got the union advantage because their wages went up. And even some of the white collar workers who had any brains also knew that right after we got something, they did. Like that dental plan I mentioned? Oh, the supervisors, they got it three weeks after we settled that contract for our dental plan. That union advantage came to them too. The wage gap, my friends, between the union movement and the non-union movement now is six dollars an hour. Six bucks an hour. Now to put that in context, those young workers that will start in that shipyard, in that great construction project that's going to go on here for the next 25 or 30 years, will make $600,000 more in their lifetime than a non-union worker working in a non-union shipyard. $600,000. Just think about that. That means the ability to buy a home, to pay off that mortgage on that home over your lifetime, to raise your kids, to send them to university, and yeah, to retire in dignity. That union advantage means one simple thing, a quality of life. But you know, it also built this country. And it built communities that would thrive and flourish. It's kind of like the ships that we're going to build here. Like John F. Kennedy said, a rising tide lifts all ships. Well, a growing union movement lifts all workers, too. It brings everybody up. We don't make the gap wider. We make the gap narrower. We bring that gap together because everybody comes up with us when we do good. So let's go out and talk about that union advantage, not just to ourselves, because we can do that easy. We don't have to convert anybody in this room, but there's other people who have to think about what that advantage means. And making public servants poorer, or taking away their pension, or lowering minimum wage, or not giving people the union advantage doesn't make the community richer, it makes it poorer. And I think it's time we said stop to those governments that we elect. Stop and start representing us, ordinary working Canadians. We built this country. We stand for a lot, but we don't leave anybody behind. So what we desire for ourselves, we wish for all. I want you to help me bring that, that it, to the government's attention. You've got a good government here, but the one in Ottawa needs to hear us a little louder and a little clearer. And they've got to leave our, take their hands off us. If they want the middle class to grow in this country, help us unionize Canada. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Ken. And uh, sisters and brothers, uh, Ken, uh, it, as many of you, I think most of you know, I guess, is that uh, in, in lieu of giving a presentation, uh, we asked our speakers uh, who uh, we make a donation in their name, and Ken's is going to the United Way. So thank you very much, brother. Thank and thank you for spending the time with us.